today, because being a postgraduate uh, teaching session, I thought I'll just touch upon mainly the basics and finally probably what we do in uh, power setup also, probably time permits, I will cover that also. Of course, one must be uh, give a lot of respect to these people. If, if you see, even 1920 people have done nerve crossings. 1920, almost about a century back. And uh, still, uh, as discussed earlier, some of our centers are not initiating this. I think we should take it in a big way to start the brachyplexus surgery. The main thing is, in brachyplexus surgery is what the mind do not know, the eyes do not see. So you must have a thorough knowledge about a three-dimensional anatomy, the pathophysiology of these nerve injuries and their regeneration. And you must know how to examine this place because it's not like other peripheral nerve injuries. So there are so many things to look into that. So the clinical examination, you must be thorough. And subsequently, probably with your clinical examination, you must come to some diagnosis. And all your radiological investigation and neurophysiological investigation will only go on to support that. So these three, of course, we have discussed that in detail. These are the common patterns of injury. Total palsy, upper plexus C5-6, or it can be C5, 6, 7, or even extended. Lower plexus is very rare. And supraclavicular is more common than infraclavicular. Infraclavicular, as we discussed earlier, you should always suspect a vascular injury. And isolated nerve injuries and double level injuries are also common, especially when you have a fracture of the head of the humerus or scapula or clavicle, you can have double level lesions. And this is the statistics from Vendor Hospital. This was about almost 10 years back. Probably now it has uh, statistics would have tripled now. And uh, but if you see the global palsy is almost about 50%. Five, six, seven, about roughly about a quarter quarter. And the lower plexus is only less than about one percent like that. So especially the five, six and five, six, seven, you can give them very good results. So you must try to do these nerve repairs as early as possible. So Starting from the examination point of view, I think one must be thorough with this brachial plexus diagram. So you must always have it in your clinic as well as in the theater also, because many times we ourselves have a difficulty in identifying which is uh, anterior division, which is posterior division, like that you can have confusion. So you must always have this diagram, especially when it is damaged, pulled and uh, goes behind the clavicle then it is very, the whole thing will be totally jumbled and very difficult to see the normal anatomy. So these are the functional divisions. If five is gone, shoulder will go. Six is gone, elbow will go. So C8, T1 is involved, hand will go. Whereas if C7 alone is involved, nothing will happen. That's why one of the reasons why Gu from China started harvesting contralateral C7. And if you look at this, this is the intra- spinal segment, the nerve, they arise by dorsal and ventral rootlets. You will have nearly about 15 to 20 small, small, almost like very tiny fascicle-like joining together to form the dorsal and ventral root. And here, the dorsal root, you will have a ganglion. So this is a sensory ganglion. Ventral root is purely motor. Both of them will join to form the trunk. This is the Typical spinal nerve. This is this will be at the foraminal level. Foraminal level. After it comes out, it immediately divides into a ventral rami and a dorsal rami. This dorsal rami goes to the back and supplies all the paraspinal muscles and the segmental sensation to those areas. And this goes on to form the brachial plexus. From C5 to T1 goes on to form the brachial plexus. And uh, of course, all this I will not go into detail. And this was just discussed earlier why the root or C56 are protected. Here you see the transverse radicular ligaments. They arise from the transverse process and get attached to the root. So whenever there is a pull from here, it ruptures here rather than pulling it from the spinal cord. But if you have a avulsion of the transverse process of the that's a spine. Uh, spine, you can imagine what will happen to this root. 
invariably there will be a root avulsion also. So you have to specifically look for avulsion of the transverse process. And why we get a brachial plexus injury? Mainly because of this evolution. The human upper limb is very mobile, unlike the lower limb where the pelvic girdle is very firmly stuck. The shoulder girdle is very mobile. So because of this, all kinds of injuries can pull this plexus in various directions. And as they emerge from here, it is between these two muscles, the scalenus anterior and the medius. So this muscles itself can act like a nutcracker and crush those uh, at the rami, ventral uh, rami level. And this goes below the clavicle. And beyond that, if you see, it is again behind the pectoralis minor tendon. So whenever there is a pull or a avulsion like this, a traction like this, this head of the humerus will pull and lever this plexus and all these pectoralis minor, clavicle, and everything will start injuring the plexus and they can have various kinds of injuries. The first thing you see in a patient is as he comes immediately when he sits, first thing is you, you see the face. You see the striking, Horner syndrome. So what does it mean, Horner syndrome? That means there is a T1 root level injury, the lower plexus injury. Why? Because that is closely associated with this ganglion here. So these fibers are also damaged. That's why they get a Horner syndrome. And next, if you have an X-ray, you see the dome is elevated like that. Immediately you suspect a C4 injury. That is the phrenic nerve injury. And you see the, this is the left side diaphragm elevated. This is the right side diaphragm elevated. Whenever you have a right side paralysis and the diaphragm is elevated, you got to be cautious because you must have the difference between left and right more than two rib segments. If it is there, then you suspect a phrenic nerve injury. Whereas left side, it will be definitely obvious. It will be obvious like this. For a right side, it may not be obvious. But here also, patient had a phrenic nerve injury. And if you have a diaphragm elevated, you have a Horner syndrome. That means C4 is gone, T1 is gone. And you do an MRI, and you have pseudomeningocele at all levels. That means that is a total palsy. This is an example of a patient with a total palsy. The whole limb will be flying. That means all the roots are avulsed. Here you don't wait for even two months, three months. So at the end of three weeks or four weeks, whenever he's fit, you try to take him for surgery and do whatever is the protocol. So again, this is what I want to, the, the, the presentation you clearly did not mention about what is the status of the scapula. And this is the classical winging of scapula. Sometimes in obese patient, you can easily miss it, the scapula. So what, what, is, what do you mean by winging of scapula? The scapula must be closely stuck to the chest wall or the back of the chest. And it is covered by these trapezius. And underneath you have the rhomboids levator scapulae, rhomboids minor and major. And laterally you have the serratus. So these are all paralyzed. This just brings out the weight of the limb itself, pulls the scapula out. This is called the winging of the scapula. And I think why the movie is not working. Sir, change from laser pointer to this one, sir. Ah, yeah. You see, these are all the branches going on to form the nerve to serratus. Can you see the chest wall there? Can you see here? Again, I'll show there. You carefully see the chest wall here. You see that is moving. So that is the serratus. So you stimulate the branches going to the from C5 and C6. And in this patient, the branch going from C5 was not working. Whereas the branch going from C6 was working. 
and the MRI also said C5 root is ours. C6 root is partially damaged. They didn't come out about that. So that means we cannot use the C5 root. The here on examination, the clinical examination, I mean uh, intraoperatively on simulation, there is nothing there. But the root is healthy. Structurally, it's healthy. You will be tempted to use that now. But if you have to correlate with your MRI finding, and if possible, try to dissect this branch going to the serratus, simulate and see. Here, this was stimulatable, not stimulatable, whereas one coming from C6 was stimulatable. That means C6 we can utilize, whereas C5 we cannot utilize. So second thing is, whenever the patient has a total palsy, how do you examine this winging of scapula? Winging of scapula, we are always taught that we have to push against the wall. When the hand is paralyzed, how will they keep the hand on the wall? So you ask them to lie down and ask them to lift the shoulder like this. This is shoulder protraction test described by Bertin. If they're able to lift the shoulder and you palpate here, you palpate here, look for the serratus uh, contraction here. If that is there, that means at least one of the roots or all three or all, two of them are available for your nerve repair. That is C567. Among these three, at least one or two is there intact and that supplies the serratus. So why do you want to see all this? Mainly because we want to categorize that into preganglionic or postganglionic. Once you know it is preganglionic, we know that it is not going to regenerate. So we can take them for surgery earlier. So we try to give every minute to the regenerating now. So if it is postganglionic, you wait for that. Some people wait for about three weeks for the neuropraxia to grow. Some people wait for about three months to see how the from proximal to distal, how the recovery is. If the recovery is progressive, you just wait. If the recovery is not progressive, then you try to intervene. And this again, if there is a complete paralysis of pectoral is major, because you all know pectoral is major has got a dual innervation, medial pectoral and lateral pectoral. Medial pectoral comes from medial cord, and lateral pectoral comes from the lateral cord. So if both are paralyzed, that means it is a total palsy. It need not be preganglionic, it can be postganglionic also, but all the roots are involved. And whenever you examine, you must have this muscle chart and the sensory chart and go accordingly. Once you finish the clinical examination, you try to look for the MRI. And this is a normal MRI. This is a normal MRI. You see the spinal cord and see the, all the rootlets coming like this. You must sit with the radiologist and ask for a section like this. Once or twice, if you sit with them and ask them various sections, then they probably will be able to give a good uh, MRI pictures. Here you can see these are all intact, whereas here there is pseudomeningosia. Again, at the foraminal level, they must be able to see. This is C4, this is C5, 6. Like that, they must be able to mark and give it to you so that you can correlate with your clinical findings. One unfortunate thing in brachial plexus is all of them can coexist. C5, you can have a lesion in continuity. C6 and 7, you can have rupture. 8 and T1, you can have avulsion. So your, our job is to mainly identify which route is available, even because in total palsy, even one or two routes, if they're available and they're healthy, it goes a big way in re, uh, I mean, reconstructing the plexus. Of course, as I said earlier, the nerve conduction study and EMG study only should supplement your clinical findings. And uh, you have to see the neck. Here you see there's a right-sided palsy. It is a total palsy. On the left side, it is all soft and supple. It is hollow. On the right side, it is totally full. It is hollow. Right side is full. And when you tap it, you see how he winces. How he winces. That is the typical tinnel sign. If you have a tinnels like that, strong tinnels, that means there are some roots which are available for you to repair. So 
this patient, if you see, you see the sloping of this shoulder. The left side, there is a paralysis. Okay. Right side is normal. Uh, you see the difference between this and this. It is sloping. <coughs> and you see now, this is normal side. This is the trapezius, very bulky trapezius. Whereas on this side, if you see, there's a big hollowness there. That means the spinal accessory is also gone. Along with that, he has a scapula fracture. So he can have multiple level injuries. And this is one of the worst kind of injuries. We will have to examine the front and back of this patient, both the neck and shoulder. And if you carefully see, there is no, no winging of scapula. There is no winging of, though trapezius is paralyzed, no winging of scapula. But you see the bulge here. That is the rhomboids. That is the rhomboids. Okay? They are obliquely going like that, from below upwards like that. So rhomboids major will be down, minor will be above. Above that will be your levator scapula. In fact, we could see the fibrillations here in this. And how do you test for rhomboids? You must try to insinuate your finger behind the scapula and ask them to raise to military position. Your finger should be pushed out. You see, the finger should be pushed out. That means because trapezius is only covering that. That will not push your finger. Rhomboid, whereas it is inserted along the medial lip of the scapula. When it contracts, it will just, your finger will be pushed out. If that is happening there, that means the rhomboid is intact. So in typical, this is what you, you presented today. Exactly the same, similar patient. So this is a classical upper plexus C56 lesion. In all these patients, apart from examining, you must see the brachioradial is also. Brachioradial, what is the root value? It is C6. So here in the right side, if you see, that will be absent. Many times we miss these small uh, important muscles because this is again the same patient. The hand and wrist, everything is normal. Extension, everything will be normal. But you'll have to specifically look for FCR and uh, all the muscles you have to, just because it's an upper plexus, you should not ignore all other hand muscles. You have to investigate. And this is again the same patient. If you see, the right side, he has upper plexus falsity. And you see the pectoral here, whereas here it is not is there is some pectoral movement, but more than this side, if you see, it is only the pectoral is minor bulge you are seeing. That will go vertically upwards like that, towards the coracoid process, not towards the humerus. That is pectoral is minor. Some problem with the computer. Can you bear with me? And if you see, your patient was also similar to this. Patient was not able to abduct the shoulder, not able to bend the elbow, whereas hand was all right. Hand was all right. He's not able to supinate or external rotate. There's a wasting of the intraspinatus muscle, supraspinatus. That on lying down, you see, he's able to fully abduct. That means the axillary nerve in this patient is working. Uh, 
Of course, this is a lower plexus palsy. The shoulder is all right, elbow is all right, but hand totally the intrinsic palsy is there. But something like a total flaw. This is typical of lower plexus palsy. And this again is a lower plexus. Shoulder, elbow, everything is fine. Whereas the hand will be paralyzed. But if you see a picture like this, you got to be even more worried. Here you can see a complete trapezius palsy, the winging of scapula, and uh, complete atrophy of the shoulder, pectoral, everything, and spine turning to other side. And this also, a huge pseudomeningocele in the neck. See, the neck itself is taken to the other side. It's all worse kind of what we call it as scapulothoracic dissociation. Apart from total, almost all the muscles which are attaching the scapula to the thorax, that is all paralyzed. So you can see the patient itself will be tilting to one side, to the side, the worst kind of thing. But some of these nerves has got a tendency to get involved twice, that is, the proximally also it will be involved, and distally also, distally also because it goes through a narrow tunnel like this, the suprascapula and the, the quadrangular space, the axillary nerve, and the musculocutane is also as it enters the coracobrachialis. They all can get again injured in the trauma nerve. And this patient, the young boy, you see, is not able to abduct. It's mainly the initiation of abduction is not there. He had an upper plexus, classical upper plexus palsy, but everything recovered. Even axillary neck recovered, biceps recovered, but he was not able to abduct. So when he explored, we found the suprascapular nerve to be thinned out. So we excised the thinned out portion and re repaired that nerve, and this is the end of four months. And you can have isolated injury to the axillary nerve also. So, in all intraclavicular injuries, this is what we were discussing earlier, especially if you have a severe scarring and all those things in the below the clavicle here in this region, we have to suspect a subclavian artery injury. Of course, he came about three or four months later. At that time, we are not going to do a vascular repair. But if he is suspected on day one or day two, must get a vascular opinion and try to repair that segment. And uh, this again we discussed earlier, if this segment is blocked because of this collaterals around the scapula going directly to the third part of the axillary artery, the third part of the, which is the subscapular system. From here to the transfer cervical, it can go like this into the subscapular system. And this is what you see in the angiogram. This is the Another patient where you can see how the collaterals going into that in the third part of axillary artery. So whenever you do any surgery later on, the muscle transfer, and you should not disturb the system. So you must take care of the system. So once you have a diagnosis, you have, must have a protocol, you must have a plan. So whenever there's a stab injury or a gunshot injury, you have to immediately explore. There's no point in waiting. If it is a preganglionic, you pretty well know preganglionic. Wait for about three, four weeks. At the end of one month, you try to take him for exploration. All other postganglionic injury or any other injury, wait for three months. If there's no recovery, you try to explore. And suppose at the end of six months, if there is incomplete or, or patchy recovery, then also you try to uh, you are you can go in and explore and try to do selective uh, neurotization. But if the recovery is progressive, you continuously, continuously try to observe them. And uh, end of six months, nine months, they will be able to have normal movements. And uh, most of them are recovered. They have some reticular deformity. Then you plan for a, this is a broad, uh, a secondary reticular. This is a broad outline of our protocol. Of course, how do you explore? We always explore under fumicens. And we instruct our anesthetist not to give any muscle relaxant. And we liberally use this nerve stimulator to check all the nerves, whatever nerves we are exploring. And uh, now we go on to some clinical cases, C5 lesion, 6 lesion, 
the end of three months there was no recovery of shoulder and biceps we did uh, neuralysis this is the phrenic now this is the phrenic now and this is the upper trunk and uh, there was a scarring in this and uh, once you release all the scar you again do a nerve stimulation if you think it is all functioning then probably you can wait and watch in this case we decided to wait and watch and this is the recovery after nine months occasionally there will be a neuroma which is not conducting this is the neuroma you can excise that and uh, very rarely you can get this kind of primary repair the upper trunk was primarily repaired like this most of the time we end up in cable grafting like this this is the upper trunk where we have done about five or six cable grafts but if suppose at the root level there is a pre ganglionic injury and uh, moreover you don't want to wait for so long you can go for directly for a nerve repair I mean, nerve crossing what we discussed earlier the som sac oberlin spinal accessory like that we call it quadruple muscle transfer first one is spinal accessory to suprascapular oberlin 1 and 2 ulnar will go to biceps median will go to brachialis and the longer down triceps will go to the axillary nerve this is called as quadruple transfer for c5 6 classical palsy and uh, here and here we clearly see this is a c4 root this is a c6 root five is missing that means we cannot rely on the c5 root so what we did was we explored and directly went for a nerve crossing and we did spinal axis suprascapular and all down down to this is after one year same patient this patient if you earlier you saw c5 was absent whereas here if you see the mri mri says c6 is absent c6 is absent and this is the amount of abduction he was able to do and elbow flexion he was able to do so we explored and we found suprascapular was not working so we did spinal axis to suprascapular <clears throat> and biceps was stimulatable whereas brachialis was not stimulatable so we did a median now we did a median now to base a brachialis and uh, axillary now was explored stimulation was equivocal we just neuralized so this is at the end of one year like that. He had a full abduction, full external rotation, almost normal. So when seven is also paralyzed, extended palsy, you cannot do Som Sachs procedure or Susan McKinnon's procedure. You cannot take branches from the radial nerve to axillary. So we have to find some other source. So where can we take it? Either intercostal, phrenic, or C4, you can take it. And take a nerve graft or directly intercostal means directly you can connect it to axillary nerve so and what you do for the wrist drop and finger drop probably you can do a tendon transfer but for now for that also now you have a distal nerve transfers as available and this is a typical c5 6 7 palsy along with shoulder abduction is not there elbow flexion not there patient has a wrist drop finger drop and thumb drop and you see a pseudo meningo seal at C7 level and 5, 6, they have said at partial evolution. That means you cannot rely on these roots. You have to do only a no crossing. So when do you suspect extended pulse? Whenever there is a radial nerve pulse, whenever there is an absence of FCR, pectoral is major, LD, or palmar is longest, whenever there is an absence of triceps, whenever there is an absence of ECR, whenever there is an absence of pronata quadrators. When these things are absent, you have to suspect your extended pulse. For the same patient, what we did was one fascicle of ulnar nerve to biceps was given, and he took phrenic nerve to axillary by a nerve graft. And one fascicle of the median nerve was given to posterior process. So this, what, this is the result of one fascicle of median nerve to posterior process. He is able to have a good wrist extension and finger extension and thumb extension. 
still his shoulder was not very strong. Suppose if the nerve transfer fails or he comes later. In fact, this is a doctor. He had a twice nerve transfer done. Oberlin 1 and 2. Twice he was done. Second time also it was re-explored and done by, not by us, by some other person. He came to us two years after the failed nerve transfers. So what we did was a muscle transfer, trapezius for shoulder and LD for external rotation. And we did a rectus femoris for the biceps. So this is all salvage procedures. When a failed nerve transfer or the patient comes to you a little late. In fact, he's a surgeon, but he went on to an administrative job in Apollo itself. But treatment for total palsy is still not standardized and is a race against time. And many people have different pro protocol and uh, we have devised a protocol in the past uh, 10, 15 years and come to a what we call the all-in-one or whole-in-one procedure. Earlier, we used to do nerve repairs, nerve grafts, selectively target some of them. And here is the total palsy, five months duration. Long nerve grafts have been targeted to axillary, biceps, radial like that. And uh, this uh, he has a good, they all will have good shoulder and elbow, but no hand function because we are not targeting the hand. You see, very good shoulder and elbow, but no hand function. This patient, another patient who came from Singapore, he didn't have a, uh, he had a, a, a below elbow amputation. So in a way, we need not bother about hand, but we have to neurotize all this. He has a total avulsion of all roots were Avuls and pseudomeningal cell at all levels. So nothing was available. Everything came from extra plexal. So nerve crossing, there is two things. One is intra plexal, extra plexal. Oberlin is all intra plexal. Spinal accessory suprascapular is the extra plexal. So this is what we did in this patient. Spinal accessory to suprascapular and C4 to axillary, phrenic to biceps and brachialis, and intercostal to pectoral and the triceps. So like that, we neurotized six segments in this patient. And you see, after about two years, almost a normal shoulder movement, mainly because we are neurotizing the pectoral also. You do only suprascapular and axillary, you will not get this kind of forward flexion. And adduction also, yes. Adduction to the chest wall is also a very important function, especially in shoulder total palsy. And here you can see he's able to. Of course, because we have used phrenic now, he is struggling to do the flexion and extension. Intercostal was used for triceps. So this gave us hope that we can neurotize all these muscles, proximal muscles with the available extra plexal and bring in contralateral C7 for hand. So this idea, we got it from Gu, and he was the one who started this contralateral C7 transfer, and we modified according to our needs and what we call as all-in-one or whole-in-one reconstruction. We try to reconstruct nine segments like this, and uh, this is the vascular is unknown now graph based on the superior ulna collateral artery. Based on that, you take it, you nearly about 52 centimeters of vascularized nerve graft, take it, you flip it, and take it to the contralateral side. Take it to the contralateral side like this, and connect it to the contralateral C7. And earlier, we were sequentially connecting to all the recipient nerves, like one cuniculus will go to axillary, one will go to this is to axillary, this is to biceps, brachialis, and uh, this the distal end we were dividing and giving it to anterior and posterior interosseous nerves. So we targeted six nerves in this. So what was the result we got? We got very good shoulder, very good elbow, but a bizarre hand movement. It was not a coordinated movement. It was not useful at all. So we thought we have to concentrate more on hand. So, and uh, subsequently we included intercostal also. And in this patient, we started 
intercostal to triceps. Two intercostals were taken to triceps. And here you can see very good shoulder and elbow, a good wrist extension, finger extension, but there was no finger flexion in this patient. In fact, he's a MNA working in one of the PFCs near Kurtani, and he was using this as a supportive hand. It's more than about uh, nine, ten years now. He wanted to do a functional muscle transfer for the finger flexion, but he was happy with this uh, rehabilitation of the right hand. He was using it as a supportive hand and started using writing with his left hand. So, to get more of hand, we thought we should target the entire frontolateral uh, C7 to the entire, uh, all the motor branches of radial nerve and the entire median nerve. So this is our currently what we do. One third will go to radial all motor branches at the level of elbow. And two third will go to the entire median nerve, not only to post interosseous or anti interosseous Along with that, intercostal three to four will be taken to, two will go to triceps like this, one to pectoral and one to serratus. And once we started doing this, Still, we were not able to get a good hand function, mainly because some fibers were going proximally to axillary and all. So, it's just like in vascular steel phenomena, proximal steel phenomena, the first nerve which is corrupted will rock and rob all the axons. So, to overcome this, we started utilizing taking nerve grafts to axillary, biceps, and brachialis and concentrate to vascularize the ulnar nerve graft only for radial and medial. So this is what subsequently we started doing after that. And uh, this is the kind of result we were getting. Earlier we were getting a very good elbow flexion, but because now we are using long nerve grafts for biceps and brachialis, the elbow flexion was not good. So we were suffering by the lack of elbow flexion. Triceps was good, the bicep, I mean, pectoral was good, shoulder was all right, but elbow flexion was. So we wanted good elbow flexion. So what we did was subsequently, we started utilizing dual source for elbow flexion. One will be from the vascularized ulnar nerve graft. The other one will be a sural nerve graft coming from contralateral C7 or any other donor nerve, either C4 or phrenic or any other nerve from the same side. So we call it a dual innervation. And uh, subsequently, after doing this, we were sure about definitely getting an elbow. You can see almost a independent elbow flexion he was able to do. So this is what our current protocol for getting an elbow flexion. Because we are harvesting the ulnar nerve, the ulnar innervated FTP will not regenerate. To avoid that, so we tag all the FDP together. So if index FTP comes, all FTP, all fingers can start flexing. Along with that, we also start doing a static opponents plastic we, because we are already denervating the FCU by taking ulnar nerve. So we are not innervating the ulnar nerve also. So, so take this FCU, loop it around like that and bring it back and suture it. It's a strong opponents plastic like the static, of course, it's a static opponents plastic. So this is the current scheme which we are doing now. Nine nerves are targeted along with static opponents plasty and FTP target. This I call it as all-in-one or whole-in-one reconstruction. And because we are innervating the entire median now, what kind of sensation do they get? And here my colleague Dr. Girish is touching. He's not feeling anything. And now he's touching. He's saying he's able to feel. Is asking where does it feel? Is able to feel on the contralaterals. So only in the median nerve territory you can feel the sensation. So some protective sensation can be there. And uh, does the limb become independent? Yes, definitely. Even Gu has said it will take four years, five years for the limb to become independent. And this is about nearly about four, four and a half years now. And 2018 we did this patient. See, very good uh, shoulder abduction. And he was able to swing, good elbow flexion. 
That is the action of triceps. Of course, gravity also helps. So once they get this kind of finger flexion, we give them an out trigger. We give them an out trigger like this and uh, increase the power of flexion. And uh, the another question is, can we neurotize the antagonist muscles? That is both radial and medial. Because many times people say you can neurotize musculocutaneous and medial, not radial and medial. Uh, but uh, we always do both radial and medial. This is also about five years now. Can you see? Both supination and pronation is able to do. We don't get these kind of results in all patients. Only in about 25% of patients, we get these kind of results. Which 25, again, little unpredictable, especially the hand. Shoulder we can promise, elbow we can promise, but definitely hand still is not, we cannot promise 100%. And I'll end with this. Can they do bimanual function? Yes. And you'll be surprised to see in this patient, even the thinner muscles recovered in this patients. You can see the thinner muscles recovered. So, we try to innervate as many muscles as possible and try to innervate the whole limb so that the limb is not uh, totally dissociated from him. The patient, especially in a global palsy, he thinks the, the limb doesn't belong to him. So our aim is to, as much as possible, try to incorporate the limb into the body and so that the patient can be happy with that. This we published in IJPS. And uh, secondary procedures, when do we do? And uh, as I said earlier, the first two procedures, I mean, the, the static opponents plasty and the FTP tacking, we do in the primary itself. Subsequently, if the wrist is not stable, wrist is not good, we go for arthrodesis. And after five years, if elbow is not working or the finger flexor is not working, then we go for a free functional muscle transfer. So in conclusion, I would like to say, a brachial plexus surgeon must be thorough with the three-dimensional anatomy and must be aware of all permutation combinations available so that he or she can offer the best possible solution at the first opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, thank you. Ma. All right. described uh, everything basics. Uh, what to uh, learn in uh, young age, the dynamic age, after completing the MCH, uh, a few people join the centers where regularly this type of work is going on. Definitely, they will be very useful after uh, joining the teaching hospitals and uh, can take up this uh, field as their. Uh, um, so, I, if anybody is having any uh, questions and doubts from audience, uh, they can unmute and ask the questions. Sir, good sir, evening. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, today's session was fantastic. I was a bit late. I was five minutes late, but I was that throughout the session. It was fantastic because uh, I personally learned a lot from Bandari sir because the first person with whom I was trained was Bandari sir and then again he has come today and uh, again today I learned a lot from him. So today's session was in fact so nice. In fact, uh, uh, your presentation sir, Purushadhan sir was also, uh, it was so nicely presented because a uh, lot of uh, concepts you have actually shown. Personally, I had actually experience of uh, uh, seeing some of your patients who had a, 
the whole uh, nerve uh, this one repaired i think after two or three years after the repair they had come here first it was a malayali they had come here to our opd to see and then i had seen where i had actually personally seen the hand functions he was actually getting finger flexion at that time uh, so i had asked him to come and meet you again to show you also so we were pretty excited in that in in those times you know when we get direct nerve uh, uh, repairs you do sir uh, just one question sir what is your experience uh, in using wang's procedure for total brachial plexus pan brachial plexus palsy sir uh, actually still i have not uh, the last couple of meetings also i have seen uh, wang i have not ventured into that uh, area at all but many people are doing it bhatia is doing it nehate is doing it and uh, piyush piyush jo joshi is doing it and uh, some of i feel they are concentrating mainly on adduction flexion of fingers and uh, i don't see any of the results showing a shoulder or a elbow like this what is your opinion hari yes sir <clears throat> so we have we have done uh, long procedure in children basically in children uh, we have done but we are not done direct neurotization shoulder to axillary nerve is good because it gives the spine free to axillary and it's good but help time we because the medial maybe is taken in wrong procedure then or does not come so we have done fmt for two of the kids but yes uh, finger flexion is quite yes. so that's the only advantage yeah, of for jodan sir exactly the same observation i also had sir because we have also done a few cases but in those cases we were not shoulder abduction came elbow extension came finger movements came but elbow flexion was not <laughs> so like that so and it was consistently coming like that uh, so again it's a bit whether to do not to do this kind of maybe wrong kind of thing essential to muscle fit like i think uh, yeah. advantage of knowing all this is then take a permanent of, of things what so want to the one the elbow flex shoulder up if from elbow flexion now we have pulled away from anything for the fingers bicep we talked about the other right or go sir good evening sir எக்ஸ்ப்ளோரேஷன் அண்ட் ரிப்பேர் சார் then will if we repair if no improvement then you go for muscle transfer sir only an adult palsy maybe after uh, one and a half two years they come to you if there is no shoulder no elbow then you can think about up to one year there is a chance for you to do some no no procedures there no nothing like no procedures okay sir Uh, okay sir sir hari sir please sir i have a question sir what is the procedure to restore the supination supination function sir so you told that after elbow flexion we have to restore the supination no no supination will come only with good biceps recovery we don't do anything specific for supination if you get good biceps recovery supination comes okay sir thank you now now we have started combining in adult brachial plexus which we just published it now it to do a derotation anatomy of humerus because in many of the c5 c6 c7 even after nerve transfers the external rotation peak so both patients have external rotation we have doing derotation osteotomy like in children and the results are quite good 
Even in some patients following FFMT for elbow flexion, the FF causes very strong elbow flexion, but the hand is internally rotated. So it goes to the rotation that come out. What of if we do, we very, very frequently do and quickly do a wrist fusion. Once you do a wrist fusion, what happens? Uh, whatever you do with the hand is stable. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. I think, uh, Dr. Lakshmi, if there are no more questions, then can we wind up for the day? Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, the, madam, can I give a little uh, concluding? Yeah, yeah. Ah, definitely, sir. Okay. Thank you, madam, uh, for all this. And uh, really, I am. I should congratulate the uh, resident who has presented so nicely. And uh, even the intrinsic questions and the micro level things also she has answered. I hope at that level it will be um, difficult for many of the students. As for the other part, uh, uh, Dr. Parshanam already spoke about. Uh, in my state, in eastern part of the country, and especially in SCB, Katak, uh, actually, Dr. Myself and Dr. Vibhuti Naik, we have almost done more than uh, two centuries of cases, not because uh, we are the best, because here the orthopedic and neurosurgeons, they don't do the brachial plexus. So that was the advantage. But the disadvantage remains here that orthopedic surgeons holds back the patient for about month, six months, seven months, sometimes even one year, uh, sending to physiotherapies. So we get sometimes a very late cases because we don't have a very organized and standardized center for uh, dealing with this. I remember about uh, one decade back, Professor uh, Shridhar, he came and he did the first uh, demonstration of uh, brachial plexus nerve injury management. And I think in 2016, Dr. Uh, P.S. Bandari and has a mammoth session from the morning to the evening, a live operative workshop. And we had about 11 surgeries, and it was a live demo to all the residents and even the junior surgeons. And we have put up two thesis papers, what rightly told. That also gives the glimpses, not only thorough study of the patients and its management protocols. The only problem we faced actually, the patients of late come in a latter stage where the results and outcomes could not get to our best, uh, uh, what we expect from the patients, uh, follow-ups with us and the patient expectation also. So I think uh, this is a very nice branch as far uh, Odisha is concerned, it is in the fifth, in the number five accident cases in the country. So there are a lot of uh, road traffic accidents here with specially bikes and uh, number of cases are very high is one of the i told the leading state for having a lot of accidents bike accidents so numbers are not very less but the only problem is to get the patient at the early and the protocols already everybody is fantastic i hope uh, we follow most of the protocols but uh, only thing is the follow problems and uh, uh, to have them properly standardize the treatment for all the patients and especially secondary procedures, uh, the patient don't turn out. I do not know why, and uh, that becomes a little difficult for us. Uh, sir, especially in states where the uh, helmet, where, where they make helmet wearing helmet compulsory, yeah. where there is a lot of checking for wearing of helmet, in those states, actually, the brachial plexus cases would be very high because uh, many of them survive the accident and they end up with brachial plexus injuries rather than probably having a head injury and probably dying due to it. Yeah, I think uh, the orthopedic and neurosurgeon has to be more sensitized to send the patient, whoever doing, maybe a plastic surgeon, if he's regularly doing in an institution, I think they, they should be more sensitized in these cases. And rightly, you have told, helmet is not going to serve, save the brachial plexus injury. That is the what point. Yes, sir. 
Thank you very much. Today's Hindu paper in Tamil Nadu, they increased the fine for all traffic violences. What was 100 rupees okay. fine, now it has become 1000 rupees fine. The repeat offender gets more fine. So the incidence of accidents have come down in the last six months, it is the today's yeah. report. So it is not only helmet, the speeding, violation, everything. <laughs> So, so thank you, Dr. Hari and Dr. Bandari also, Madam also, and uh, Dr. Pasi Amar also. Dr. Lakshmi, I think all the questions yeah. are done, then I, please still yes. you can actually yes. go. Uh, thanks for. Thank, thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, I thank Dr. Uh, Bhandari, sir, for uh, sparing his uh, valuable time, accepting immediately when we asked uh, uh, him to participate in the program in discussion. And uh, I thank Dr. Purushottaman, sir. Uh, he wonderfully prepared the lecture so that the young uh, generation will get motivation and uh, take up uh, the brachial plexus injuries uh, as a... Uh, their career and uh, get trained and uh, join the teaching hospitals. And uh, Dr. Hari dynamically trained uh, uh, his uh, um, resident, uh, Dr. Nivedita, to take up the case and present it. Uh, though it is a, a new uh, thing, uh, I think uh, in future, most of the people, they try to take up uh, these cases and uh, give the good services with this uh, stimulation and uh, the motivation of our uh, uh, senior plastic surgeons who contributed their uh, law, uh, major part of life uh, in uh, uh, these uh, um, procedures, follow-up of these cases and uh, deriving the concepts and uh, uh, giving us the guidelines. Uh, ours is a biggest uh, burn and uh, trauma center, and we have NIMS uh, uh, in the same uh, city. So most of uh, the brachial plexus cases will be uh, done at uh, NIMS. Dr. Srikant could not join because of uh, his uh, personal pro uh, other uh, these things. And uh, definitely we, we, we are sending our residents to NIMS, and uh, in future we try to start doing the uh, brachial plexus cases. And uh, I too feel like a cleft, even brachial plexus should be uh, uh, trained at various centers and uh, um, they, they will be taken up in uh, uh, future in various centers. I thank each and everyone and I-